there's some fun dance with the two displays. Kind of two talks in one, but I'll try to keep it short. It's easier to focus when you split it up like that. Um, the other thing is, um, I'll, I'll put these slides online uh, at leave.net, my website, so um, you don't have to use your laptop and make take notes and stuff like that. You'll get it with the uh, full speaker notes. So I'd appreciate it if you pay attention instead of being on your laptop. So how many of you know what long is? Can you stand up? We need some movements. You've been sitting here all night. Come on, stand up. <laughs> so about half of the people here will find the first half of my talk interesting. Um, how many of you have been to a clone event, like a conference or a symposium, or not that many? There we go. We need to fix that. So um, one thing, I'm very happy to be in Brazil. Um, Brazil has always been very special to Plone in particular because um, our first translation was into Brazilian Portuguese. Uh, the people that did it even went as far as to re-implement uh, the template language for Zope to be able to translate Plone into Brazilian Portuguese. So um, you definitely go above and beyond when it comes to making software Brazilian. So it's good to be here. It's my first time in South America, and I like what I see, so I might come back. Okay, um, I'll get started on the talk. Uh, it says top 2% open source project here. Uh, what does that mean? There is a site called olo.net that measures the uh, size of open source projects, how many contributions they have, uh, how much activity they have, releases, all of that. So, Plone is one of the top 2% open source projects. Uh, Good company with Apache and lots of other interesting projects. And um, okay. so the reason I mentioned that is that a lot of people have no idea how big Plum is. Um, so some statistics: uh, it's been downloaded over a million times. Um, last year we had over 49, or over 50 contributor, new contributors, uh, and over the last 12 months, about 60 people checked in code into Plone itself, the core. There are uh, 257 people working on Plone. Uh, it has increasing year-over-year -year activity, so uh, it's been it's still growing. And as I mentioned, it's among the largest uh, open source schemes in the world. So some of the things that have happened in the Plone world lately uh, is we had some new books come out. This uh, to the left here is a development book, which is really well written. Um, it covers the current version of Plone, which was quite interesting. It, I think it's one of the first times uh, an open source project has had a book that documents the actual release ready on when it is released, because it was written in parallel with uh, the release itself. So, which is interesting because sometimes when Martin wrote this book, he had to go back and fix Plone because he was writing the book and it didn't work, right? So, uh, so it d definitely made Plone better, you know. Uh, he he had he started writing things and he's like, why is it like that? That's stupid, you know. Let's go fix it. So there was a lot of good stuff coming out of that book. Uh, the other book is interesting for a different reason. It's um, I think the first end user manual for any open source project. Uh, so it's kind of what you hand to the people that are using Plone. Like here's how to you know write content, get it published, here's how to use versioning, here's how to copy and paste content, stuff like that. And um, this book to the, the right, the end user manual, is uh, licensed under Creative Commons. And I think they're translating it into at least Spanish, so I think you should have a Portuguese Brazilian translation of that. Um, it's, uh, the website for that is phonebook.info, but um, it'll be in the speaker notes if you need to 
to Dom later. And you can also get it on Amazon.com as a hard copy if you want the actual book version. <coughs> So, um, what's going on with Planet Org? Uh, you're actually the first to see the new redesigned Planet Org, which looks like this. Uh, we, thank you. <laughs> so, um, one of the things when you do a redesign, you can never do it in the open. There's just no way. You have to do it in secret. Like if you have more than three people involved, it'll be a disaster. So, uh, so we we we've been working on this for the last, I guess, six months. Uh, and, and it's more than skin deep. There's a lot of reorganization in the different sections here. I guess I can try and see if it'll switch me over. I have a meeting in, at Google. I have lunch at Google, okay. Uh, <laughs> Let us get lunch out of the way. So, okay. Well, it's a little bit offset, but uh, this is the actual HTML. Um, of the page. There are, we use some things like this to pack a lot of information on the front page without making it very crazy. You have a documentation section like this. Of course, you can see the fun parts. But, um, we're trying to make it easier to get into it. And, um, there's a lot of rethinking of how you approach Plum. So I'm very excited about that. There you go. Um, there, uh, there's also a new uh, hardware, a new box coming, and they're upgrading it to Plum 3.0, and that should be ready before the Plum conference. And the reason it takes a little while is that we used uh, a different way of storing files for like product distribution and stuff like that. Lots of boring details you don't want to know, but that's the reason. The actual migration took about 20 minutes, but we have to rewrite something, so it took a while. And I also want to mention. Um, just one of the high profile websites that I personally like. Uh, NASA launched, uh, I'm not sure what the actual is, Science Mission Director, uh, which is essentially you know, a newbie's guide to the universe. So you can go in and you can <coughs> learn about how, you know, how the climate is affected by how the sun spots and, and the activity on, on the sun. Uh, lots of fun stuff. Look it up. So uh, the Plum Foundation. So Plum has a foundation that controls. It owns Plum. It owns the trademarks, and it takes care of a lot of the business around Plum. Um, so lately, they've been working on um, a site called Plum.net, which is more like a provider directory. So if you have a Plum company, you list yourself there. Um, people will go there to find uh, Plum people who sort by you know, I want to find old Plum providers in Brazil, stuff like that. Uh, they raise money, um, so we get some donations. It's tax deductible in the U.S., which is a big deal in the U.S. Um, they're also the fiscal agent for Plum Conference 2008, and they also sponsor conference presences. So, if you want to go to a um, a conference here in Brazil, like a big IT conference, and talk about Plum or hand out you know brochures or do some promotional work, um, contact the Plum Foundation, and we can probably help you you know pay for the material and do stuff like that. So don't be shy. And the other thing they did was, or we did, they did, uh, is to organize something we call the Strategic Planning Summit, which was uh, a meeting of some of the core people plus some of the new people at Google. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, another thing we've been focusing on is evangelism. Uh, we're gearing up uh, something called the World Clone Day, uh, which is in, anybody can remember when it is? It's like November? November 7th? Okay, so all over the world, November 7th, uh, the people will be giving talks on phone and showing people how to use phone and generally evangelize. And generally, uh, I recommend if you're into phone at all, please help us get the word out because a lot of people don't know what it is and what it does. So, which half of the people here might not know. So, I, I forgot to mention that phone is a content management system. Um, anyway. You can probably find it online. I, I probably can't tell you what Plum is right now. <laughs> um, there's a Plum conference coming up. Sorry if I'm a bit fast here. I, I want to get to the interesting parts for the people that don't are not into Plum. Um, it's October 8 to 10 in Washington, D.C. And it's probably a bit late now if you want to make travel plans, but you should be there. 
So an important thing that has happened in Clone is uh, a maturing of the community. Like, Clone has been around for, I think, almost nine years now, a bit over eight years. And a lot of the people that started out with Clone back in the day have become really, really professional developers. And so you can kind of see it in the kind of focus that goes around Clone now. We're more concerned about stability, ease of migration, um, those kind of things. Uh, we're trying to not become boring just because we need to be stable. So it's a very fine, fine balance. Uh, there's a lot of consolidation of projects. Uh, you know, there used to be lots of forum projects. There used to be lots of newsletter projects. There used to be lots of uh, various solutions for Clone. And it's kind of, they've start, started to co collaborate and started to make one good project within a certain area, which is very good. Uh, the other thing is that we built Clone on top of Zoe and on top of CMF and on top of Python, of course. Uh, and most of the people that started out in the beginning didn't really understand the entire stack. So a lot of decisions were made in the beginning that made no sense, but we didn't know it at the time. So uh, right now, people there are a lot of people that understand the entire stack and they know what needs to be done to, you know, get rid of some of the dark, dark edges of Zope and stuff like that. So we're we're working on that. Uh, but the important thing is that we have the right technology for what we're doing, and we have the right people. And if you have the right technology and the right people, it's just a matter of time, and you'll get that. So I'm, I'm very happy about the, the kind of community we've built. It's a very, it, it's funny, every time somebody comes in from another uh, framework or anything like that, they're always floored by how friendly the community is online. Like on RC, you come in, you ask a question, people answer, stuff like that. So definitely, if, if, if if, if there is one thing I want to pull out about Clone, it's the great community around it. And, and that's continuing, and I'm very happy that even after eight years, it's still an open, welcoming community. Uh, there are also kind of spin offs of Clone, like uh, Clone Gov and Clone EDU, which are uh, government and education uh, focused versions of Clone, which are, they're kind of starting to gear up their own uh, dis distributions of Clone, if you will, uh, which is kind of a pre packaged, you know. All uh, educational institutions need, uh, you know, timetable things, or all government things need some sort of feedback mechanism. But there are certain best of breed components that go into those distributions. <coughs> so this is the uh, planning summit that I was talking about. Uh, we had a lot of different people there, uh, from the people that invented Plum up to people that started using Plum a couple of months ago, because we wanted a very broad. Um, audience to discuss. So what we did here was we didn't write a single line of code, which was very good. Um, we talked about what we want to do in the next year, in the next five years, in the next 10 years, uh, and how we can change Plone to be more approachable. Uh, so one of the big themes was we just put a label on it, we called it approachability. It's essentially when you when you walk off to Plone for the first time, what should happen? Like, what's your first success metric? How can you get a quick success? Like, I can edit the page, I save it, wow, okay, it changed, cool. What do I do now, right? Um, I wanna create my own types. How can I do that easily? I wanna deploy it to my server, how can I do that easily? So, knocking down all those very simple things and making it very clear, like the first, you know, what, what do you wanna accomplish in the first week, and the first, sorry, the first day, the first week, and the first month of phone usage. So, and it was great to have uh, these people here. Uh, I want to call out one person, which is Jonathan. He's uh, 16 years old, and he uh, is probably a better clone skinner than a lot of people I've met. Did I despair? Um, so he, he was part of the, uh, Google has something called uh, highly open participation, which is kind of like summer code, but for um, high school students. And he was part of that. And he's done an amazing job. And getting involved with the Plum community and doing lots of valuable stuff. And he's coming to the sprint in DC, which I'm very excited about. So uh, the, the stuff that came out of this, we did a lot of brainstorming, you know, lots of sticky notes, lots of voting, lots of running around. Uh, but we, we distilled it down to actionable things we can do to make Plum better. And we tracked those in our issue tracker under uh, like strategic goals. So, and people, uh, we have one champion for each strategic area, and they uh, go back and report what's happened there later. So it's kind of like, you know, reduce the major problems, process, and like technology-wise to big areas and make people responsible for it. So they don't have to do it, they just have to keep track of what needs to be done. So that was the, the main 
thing out of this. And it was funny when we did the uh, planning summit. It's like <coughs> three days later. It's like, oh, Drupal wants to have a planning summit too. Uh, so it, it's funny enough to see how these these kind of organizational things spread back and forth. I just heard about something called uh, Coding Dojo, which seemed very interesting. Um, somebody here is organizing like a, a Python thing where people code on the screen and people in the audience look at, and then they switch out. So they built a product by having people code for seven minutes each, which is, looks very interesting and very chaotic, and I'm going to watch when it happens. Um, OK, so I want to do a quick overview of what, where we're going with Plum. Um, and what the next couple of releases will bring. So, one of the things that's happened in Plum is um, there's been a lot of research done. Uh, uh, people have been looking into a lot of different things like relational database connectivity, like SQL alchemy, and stuff like that. Um, blob support, which is, makes it easier to handle, like if you upload a 600 megabyte file into Plum, what happens? Um, how do you version that? Uh, we've been working on making Plum start up faster. Um, so it used to take 20 seconds to start up. I think now it takes about seven um, in, in the current trunk, which is not a release yet. Um, we've been working on how we can make developers more productive and how, how we can make it easier to be a Python developer in Plum land. Because you know, Plum has a lot of historical baggage from back in the day when it was built on top of Zoe and on top of so it's very complex, right? And we're making it easier. We're reducing the number of concepts, getting rid of stuff, and making it easier to get into it, even though you have never touched Plum before. You know, Python, you should be able to get into it. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in, in, in very mature areas, like you know, replication, storage alternatives, indexing, all these, like, if you have five billion documents, what do you do? Um, so, and a lot of this stuff over the last year has gotten <coughs> critical mass. Like, it's gotten to a point where people started using it, and people are using it in large, large sites. And it's, people are doing a lot of performance testing and eliminating bottlenecks. So, it's becoming a lot faster. So, and these things will land in Plum in the near future. It's open source, I can't promise anything. Um, so, one of the things we want to do more is to reuse Python stuff without uh, reinventing it in Zoho. So. One of the things that we, we had a, a hypothesis in the beginning that the way ZOV3, ZOV3 is a break with ZOV2. These are different approaches. Um, and ZOV3 has a very explicit goal to make it easy to take a Python component and put in some glue adapters and keep the Python component the way it is and, and make it work with ZOV and Plone and whatever is on the other side. And uh, the good thing is that that has happened. Uh, there are a lot of examples where we use you know, SQL Alchemy, those kind of things. There isn't a crazy amount of setup to make that work. It's, it's pretty simple. It's simple, then blue layer to me. And the other thing that is exciting is uh, WSG, WSGI, uh, which you probably, I assume you've had some talks on that. If not, you should. Um, we have. Good. So uh, WSG allows us to play nicer with other frameworks, like if you want to integrate with you know, Turbogears or Django or any kind of other Python thing. Uh, you can easily talk between those things. And it's also easier to separate out things that are common, like authentication or session handling or stuff that everybody needs in every application. So it's a really cool thing because we're moving a lot of the stuff that we had in Plone out of Plone. <coughs> and a lot of the things that were so are now so independent. So if you have a TurboGIS application, you can use the repose.hu, which is an authentication front end on top of TurboGIS without having to. So one of the other things that we're embracing full speed is uh, Python X, because uh, we really want to have a good packaging story for Plum. Um, and the reason why we're so excited about this is that you know, Plum is more like an operating system than a simple uh, you know, one-time application. You add things into it, you run applications inside of it. Uh, and if you don't have a good compatibility story, a good dependency story there, you're kind of screwed, which is what we are now, right? So it's, it's hard to know if you upgrade a component whether it'll work with all the other things there. Um, so this sets us up for much better dependency handling. And in the future, what we hope to have is something like a, you go to the uh, clone setup screen, it says, you know, clone 4.5 point something is available. Uh, if you upgrade, 
or you can upgrade because all your products that you have installed on top of that are have been upgraded to work with the new version. So making it e more predictable whether you can up upgrade or not. So right now we are uh, in, a, in a we have a stable branch and we have an experimental branch. So the 3.x line of things, 3.1.5 I think is the latest. Um, they're very small, they're very focused, and they're 100% compatible with 3.0. So if we break anything, that's a major, major issue, and we won't release it. So, um, so Clone 3.1 added things like improved visual editing, some portlet magic, uh, or not magic, remove some magic actually. Um, and in 3.2, one of the big things is that we're switching everything over to X. We're making the unified installer the same across all platforms. So as you can see, we don't really change the way Clone works in 3.x, and we make it compatible with add-ons. Uh, but we try to improve the things that can be improved without affecting compatibility. And these 3.x uh, minor releases will be out every six to nine months. Um, so 3.2 is coming up now, which should be a couple of months away, I guess. And every month we have a maintenance release, which is pretty cool. Like, it's it's amazing to have that kind of stability that you know that once a month there will be a new clone bug fix release. And uh, the, the fact that people can work against those, so if you discover a buggy clone that is critical for you, you can put it in and you know within a month there will be an official release that has that fix. So that's very cool. There's a lot of a lot of process improvements in clone that are not code. It's more like making it more mature, making it more predictable. So in parallel, we're working on uh, Clone Trunk, which is what we'll be doing Clone 4.0. And I guess I'm showing my age with the Amiga Boots disc here. But um, So Clone Trunk now is going, the next release, major release of Clone goes back and it rethinks a lot of the things that we have had since the beginning. Because a lot of the things, you know, I don't know if you were around and doing web development and, you know, 99, 2000, 2001, uh, performance was not a big issue. There weren't that many. So, um, but now it's a, it's a big thing that we need to make sure uh, is uh, doing well. And there's a lot of things, you know, like I said, people didn't understand the full extent of the stack they were building on. They were reinventing things that already existed that they could have improved. So, we need to go back and revisit some of the decisions we made and uh, throw out some of those different things that we decided to do a long time ago. So, uh, Clone 4.0 doesn't really have a release date yet. What we're doing right now is to say, we go through everything and we decide how many things we want to break or pull out or whatever we want to do, and then we set a release date. So, but you have a new uh, minor release coming out every six to nine months, and a new maintenance release every four months. But I'm, I'm very excited about this because, like I said, people are so professional now. I mean, people are amazing in how they have these massive structures, you know, like uh, the company that I helped start in, in Norway, we're, we're doing a very big project for an electronics retailer, and I think they like, every night they load 40, 50,000 documents into the thing, to test performance in every possible way, and lots of very advanced like testing, so pretty cool to see that happen. So the goals of Reboot is essentially two things. We want to make it simpler to use Plum, and we make, want to make it go faster. That's essentially all we want to do. Of course, it's more complex than that. But keep, the goal, keep the goal simple in the implementation. Get to later. So I just want to show an example just so I don't talk about you know, very dry things. So this is one of the examples of how we can simplify the user interface. If you've read my blog, you probably see it. Um, so So we have the, all these like tabs, these pull down menus, there's lots of stuff going on in phone right now. Inline editing, it's, it's very powerful, but it's very confusing the first time you use it. So this is how we want it to look, with a sim single edit button and a way to add new things. And so we hide a lot of the complexity. It's, it's not gone, it's just hidden because you don't need it in your face all the time. So when you click the edit button, get this thing, and then we move the sharing options to history and other advanced things over here, and you focus on the, the actual documents. We made the, um, the visual editor much simpler. Uh, 
this is something I can talk about for hours, but uh, we're re retooling how we how you do rich media in Chrome. So making it easier to work with like movies and maps and, and all sorts of like embedded things, and also inserting different things. I don't know how much you can see of this. Anyway, it's a it's a talk in, unto itself. But we're making it simpler to work with Chrome, and I'm very excited about this because I wanted to do this for about seven years. So. And you know, we, we move things around a little bit. The status you can change in line because a lot of people forget to publish things. So I'm, I'm excited about that. And that work is starting now uh, next month uh, during the uh, phone conference. This is my last slide of this part. And it's the only slide I have with bullet points. I hate bullet points. Um, but I need some of them. Um, so bullet points suck, but notice how this thing has profit at the end, and there is no missing step. <laughs> so there is a star, though, which is for Brazil. I don't know how easy it is to start a company here. I've heard of horror stories. So starting a company is cool, but it might be less cool in, in Brazil than in other countries. But I, like, I like people that make it easy. Um, so one of the things is... That, that we're, it's interesting because when you, when you get to be a, an older open source project, you need to fight preconceptions. Like, I need to fight the ghost of Pwn 2.0, right? So people tried 2.0, and they were like, eh, I don't like this, it kind of sucks, it's kind of slow, Pwn sucks. And then they go over and do something else, five years later, they come back and said, yeah, I tried Pwn, it kind of sucks. And I'm like, so what sucks about it? Oh, yeah, no, I tried this thing, and that didn't work, and didn't have versioning and all that. And I'm like, you had versioning for five years, what are you talking about? Um, so, if you haven't looked at Pwn lately, go back and have a look. It's super easy to install now, especially with the Unicode installer. If you run one command, it installs uh, on Linux or Mac OS or Windows, whatever you're using. Um, you can also get involved by uh, translating, documenting, testing. I think we have a pretty good Brazilian translation. My Brazilian is a little bit rusty, but uh, it, it looks good to me from a distance. So, um, but have a look at it. Like, you know, if, if there are stupid things going on in Brazilian translation, we need to fix that. Because that's the second level of user interface is if you have bad translations, your product looks really retarded. So, that's a good thing. Um, there's a lot of documentation work going on. Um, there's a lot of uh, testing work, like retrofitting testing and writing tests for Zoe or phone components. And also, get involved in making it better. Take ownership of a particular area and, and that you're interested in and make something that kicks ass in that area. And the cool thing about Plum is that it makes a lot of money. Like, I think it's been estimated that we, the total Plum economy with, we have 200, no, sorry, 350 companies doing Plum now. And they pull in like, I don't know what it is, $400 million a year or something. It's, it's crazy. Um, so, there's a lot of money in, in doing phone things because it does something out of the box and it solves a real problem. So if you want to do Python and make money, phone is a very good approach. So problems. Are you up for it? I'd like to see a, a South American phone symposium. Um, I think it's there's a lot of energy down here. Uh, there's also something called phone connoisseur, which is uh, a mangled app, of course. But uh, Plum Connoisseur, I think, is uh, Argentina, Chile, I think, I guess it's Spanish-speaking uh, parts of South America. Um, and they're doing a lot of things, and they're responsible for the work of Plum Bay, actually, which is pretty cool that they started that, and now it's spreading to the entire world. So, um, a symposium, for those of you who are familiar with, with the word, it's more like a, in, in Plum terms, it means like a smaller conference, like it's, it's you know, 50, maybe 100 people, very, like, simple, uh, keep it simple and keep it cheap, and, and make just make things happen and, and get people excited about talking to each other. Because it, it helps to have a symposium in your own language. So I don't know whether you could actually have a conference with, you know, people that speak Spanish and people, people that speak Portuguese, and whether it will work out or whether you would have to have everything in English. Probably less interesting. But, but I'd like to see something like that. So, and the foundation will help doing these kind of things if you need. Financial support or stuff like that. So definitely think about it. Because you seem to be doing a great job with Python here. So. Okay, that's the poem parts. All those of you who left or not interested in poem can go back in. <laughs> I will now talk about the interesting things. Okay, this is a random number. Uh, so I'm not a fan of the you know top ten 
reasons to do blah, blah, blah. So I usually come up with lots of reasons and then I count them. So the only reason this number is there is that you know how long it is until you can get out. So we've been using 30 minutes. If we're lucky, I'll get this done in 20 to 30 minutes. And we'll have about 20 minutes of questions. Yeah. So something I didn't mention, sorry. I should have done that in the beginning. Um, if you can write down your questions. I'm not sure who's handling that. I should have, okay and give them to journalists or keep them in mind. You know, it's hard to keep a question from the first part into the second part. And ask the hard questions, okay? Don't be shy. Like if you think, you know, what are you guys doing now that Ruby on Rails is building the best CMS ever and have been doing that for the last four years? But uh, I mean, ask questions like that, right? So, uh, and I'll give you a straight answer because we're open source and we don't lie. So, occasionally lie. It's, it's for your own good. Um, so, first point, all marketing is bullshit. I don't know if you can see this, but this is a very long, uh, this is like a, uh, actually a physics professor at uh, a university in Missouri. He talks about these like ways of you know, calculating mass and Newtonian physics and stuff like that. And he's like, this is how you usually do it, and that's bullshit. It's like, he, he just, there are certain things that you, ju you just take for granted that they work that way, and if you look at it, it doesn't make any sense. So the thing with um, to think about in open source in general is that if you have a good enough project, you don't need marketing. You, I'm not saying marketing is a specific thing, but messaging is a different thing. Like having a good website is cool. It's not like you can have a sucky website and win because you can't, which is kind of sad. Uh, so you need a good website and all that, but, but don't think marketing. It's not marketing. It's communication. It's talk to the people. Make sure they understand what your product is about. Um, Trying to trying to one up the commercial um, people on marketing will not work. Like if you fight if you're fighting El Fresco selling uh, content management, they have an army of people producing glossy brochures. You know, it's you can't beat them on that front. You need to uh, attack differently and attack them on their merits instead of attacking on the glossy brochure. <coughs> so um, the thing is, like people spend a lot of money on proprietary solutions, but eventually they come around and they start doing open source. That's just a, a, a very strong movement. And we kind of have the luxury of time, whereas companies do not. Companies need to be profitable. If they start sinking, they start sinking, they need to do something radical. Open source doesn't go away just because, you know, if nothing happens for a year or two um, in, in terms of income. So just keep that in mind. Don't don't be, you know, led astray by glossy brochures and focus on what you're good at. So the other thing, but all this stuff is very obvious, by the way. So if you, if you run an open source project, you know all these things. I just want to make it e clear some of the things that you have to think about if you're starting your own little project. Um, never underestimate how this, how much this matters. Like I don't know if you've ever tried reporting a bug in Firefox or anything like that, Bugzilla. Uh, there's like a billion bugs in there, and nobody looks at them. But they recently started really maintaining their issue tracker and started closing bugs and started getting better at that. And, and that's that's your you know, one of your first lines of defense. When people report a bug, you need to make sure it gets listened to and you do something about it. And figure out smarter ways of categorizing things. You know, Spend a little time uh, tweaking your process. Make things as easy as possible on all these like administrative things because you don't want to spend any time on this. So, and, and make the actions on how to fix things as clear as possible so anybody can jump in and, and help us. I love this one. This is actually a real uh, World War II poster from England. So they, they had these like these things hanging around when, when they were at war. It's like keep calm, carry on. You know, like there's a war, but no panic, you know? Um, and and that's what I want to talk about. It's if you if you do an open source project, there will be slow periods. There will be periods where you think like, eh, we suck, you know, everybody else is innovating, we're in this like phase where we need to fix a lot of things and not a lot of exciting things are happening. Uh, there are competing frameworks and competing projects that are doing some things that are similar to what you do, whether they're proprietary or open source. And you know, just keep calm. It's, it's, there is no need to panic. Like, keep, keep working on your project, improve your project, and improve your own skills. And you'll get there eventually. And it's, People have a tendency to go, oh my god, you know, new shiny thing. Let's all switch to new shiny thing. But um, old shiny thing can be made uh, good too. So keep that in mind. Don't panic. 
competition is always good. Um, so one of the questions we always get, which is kind of, it's silly on one, one front, and it's totally understandable on one front. It's like, you know, oh, what does Plum do now that uh, Ruby on Rails exists? Or what, is, what does Plum do now that Django exists, right? Uh, so if you're not into what these different projects do, uh, that's a natural question. Like, uh, you know, will Plum disappear because Django is popular? But they don't do the same things. But what they do, they force you to refocus, right? Uh, uh, in the beginning, when Plum was a project, a lot of people came to Plum and they said, oh, I want to build an issue tracker. I'm like, well, we're content management. You can, you can build an issue tracker inside the content management system. You probably shouldn't, you know? Like, it's not what we're about to do. So it forces you to refocus. And, and I was very happy when, uh, especially when Ruby on Rails started the whole like new framework, agile framework thing going and Django came around, and Pylons, and Turbo Gears, and all those things, because all the people that came to us and said, hey, I want to build an issue tracker, I'm like, over there, it's a project called you know, Pylons, use that, bye. Um, so, because you don't want people in your, your um, system, or with your software, that are trying to do what is not built to do, that, that would just make your software suck. So, and one of the points here, I don't know if you can notice they're the same person, but if you don't have competition, invent competition. Like, Come up with what would happen, you know, in this space you're in if there were other people doing this. Try to figure out how to uh, handle that kind of thing, and, and always think, you know, somebody could come along with a better product within this niche. And do we have any like, what do we do then? There, there's a fork in the road. Do we want to do this or this? So reevaluate those kind of things along the way, and don't be afraid of it. Competition is awesome. I mean, I go to Drupal conferences, right? It's fun to go to Drupal conferences because I see how much they sell. So <laughs> it, it, it's, it's like, no, it's, it's funny. It, it's totally, it's a joke, but it's true. Like, you, you sit from the outside, and if you haven't used Ruby on Rails for a real project, or if you haven't you know, used Drupal for a real project, you're like, oh, they, they look like they're really good at what they do. I think they're, you know, they're probably cool, and, and they don't have any problems. And you go there, and you're like, oh my god. You store all the documents with a numeric ID, so if you have two sites you need to merge, you need to update all your database tables because you were stupid enough to store foreign keys by a, an integer. It's insane, you know? So you see all these like crazy things that they're struggling with. Um, and, and it keeps you balanced. So go to go to Ruby conferences. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Um, it's funny. Um, so just a side note on that. We've had a couple of people that used to be core plum people that went over to Ruby for a while because they wanted to do more web application development, but they've all come back. So uh, they go over, they learn, and they figure out, eh, you know, it's okay, but it's not really what I want to do. And so they, so far, everybody has come back. Um, this one is about being nice, uh, being inclusive. Like if you have an open source project, uh, be very lenient about who you allow in. Uh, so Plum has a project called The Collective, which is kind of an open source, uh, totally open uh, version control, sorry, sorry, like a version control repository. It's a version right now, we used to be CVS. Uh, and anybody that asks can essentially get access to that thing. So, and there are, you know, 500 projects in there. And, and I can go in and I can change code in any of those 500 projects. And how many, how many instances of abuse and like breaking have we had? Zero. So, we probably have like, 800 or 1,000 people in that have access, commit access in that repository, and it works out just fine. People are nice. And if they're not, it's easy to throw them off and roll back that minute. So be very inclusive. Uh, Plone also is very inclusive. Like, uh, I was talking to the Subversion people, which um, are great people when it comes to community. Uh, they have a lot of things to teach you. Uh, I'll talk, talk, talk about that later. But uh, they have, I think they have, like, 15 core committers, and when I mentioned to him that we have over 200 core committers, he was like, oh my god, that's crazy. So, but it hasn't been a problem, right? It's, if people have culture, if they do crazy things, they go on a branch. Just make it easy to get involved. Okay. Version control systems of all sorts. Don't fight it. One thing to watch out for, though, is that there are certain types of people that can really ruin a community. Um, so, there, I think there's a saying, I think, it's the subversion people again. They've, they've kind of written books about this, and they have a great talk called uh, Poisonous People. That, are, that is a Google video. And if you <coughs> want to manage an open source community, that's a great talk. They talk about how, how certain people you need to get rid of. It's just 
facets of life. You can't be nice to everyone. Um, because if people come in, they can change their open source project or they can steal away a lot of attention. So instead of building a better project, you're just discussing with morons, you know? And you don't want to do that, to blame wars, all that stuff. Um, so I, I won't touch on uh, that particular thing because it's been done so well in the Poisonous People talk, but look that up. It's a, it's a great talk. And there are a lot of things you need to make sure to nip in the bud because if these people are allowed to, to talk on behalf of the community, People come in from the outside and they think, oh, all these people are idiots. Just look at this. So be careful. Start a company. Again with a star. But, um, so it's possible to run a very simple simple company easily, at least in Norway. Uh, it's the only, only place I've run a company. But the first couple of years, uh, our company was three people. We had like four or five people for a while. And now it's up to, I don't know, 15, 20 people, which is, and, and we take on massive projects. So we, for the electronics thing I was talking about, so we, uh, and I don't work there anymore, but I started that company, so I'm still, still involved on the board side. They took on, uh, the competitors they had in the project they were doing were Microsoft, IBM, and I can't remember what the third one was, but like massive companies. And they won it with like seven people on their payroll. Because they say we can do this and we can do it for this price, and here's why. So you can definitely make this happen without being a very large company. Uh, the other thing, if you start a company, if you only listen to one thing I say to you, listen to this. Um, if you start a company, you pick high return things to do in the beginning. Um, it might be slightly different, but one of the things that is very high return in open source is teaching. So when we started our company, I was full time traveling the world teaching people how to use phone. And what's cool about teaching people or doing training is that it's very limited. It's like one week and it's over. You have no responsibility, no maintenance, no nothing, right? Um, it pays really well because you're an expert, right? You need to get paid well. Um, and, and you're always an expert. Like if you've been using the system, you're better than the people that hire you, obviously. So uh, there's very little risk. It pays well, has a predictable schedule, and it ends, it stops. So you can say, you know, next month I'm doing three trainings. And you know your schedule ahead of time, and you know how much money that will go in. So it's a fantastic way to start an open source company is to do training in open source. Or pick something different, like you know how open office works. If people are considering moving from Microsoft to open office, offer open office training. The system was boring. Uh, but it's, it's not that complex, really. Um, you need to care about three things. It's ownership, like who owns the code in the project. You need to care about licenses, like PSD, GPL, whatever. Um, and you need to care about trademarks. And I'll go through them. So ownership is a very uh, ominous thing. Like who owns piece of code? It's very hard to answer that. One of the things that, that we were very lucky with in phone is that from day one, pretty much, we had this contributor agreement that people signed to get access to commit code to phone, which yeah, means we can assign the ownership to Phone Foundation in this case now, but in the beginning it was just like a group of people. It was assigned to me and Alex as the founder of the phone. And what that allows you to do is that whenever somebody comes, steps up, you probably all remember SEO versus Linux, right? So they said, oh, we own some stuff in the Linux code base. We won't tell you what it is, but we own some of it, you know? Uh, and by having a contributor agreement, you can say, you know, fuck off. We own this code. We have papers here. If you have any issue with this, if you find a specific piece of code, here's the guy that put that in, talk to him, you know? Uh, and worst case, you have to back that little piece of code out. But you don't get into these like massive, ridiculous fights. Uh, and especially with software patents, this is becoming increasingly important. Uh, you probably know about Moodle, which is like a courseware kind of thing. I think it's PHP, PHP. Anyway, um, God bless them. Uh, anyway, they, they have a problem now because there's a, a pretty, pretty evil company called Blackboard, which has the same kind of software, and they have massive amounts of patents in this. And they've just acquired their only competitor, so they were the only one in that space. So they have all the patents in that uh, area. So you can't really fight patents, but at least you can fight, you know, we wrote this code by ourselves. We have it in here. Worst case, we have to read them differently. They can't shut down the project. Right? On licenses, it's very simple. Um, pick the appropriate license. There is no right license. Like there, there is a 
uh, ideological parts. So some people care about the extra things that GPL gives you. Uh, long we do, uh, but I'm, I'm also happy to open source things under BSD. Uh, the core thing is to figure out what, how people are supposed to use the product. The reason we have clone under GPL is that we don't want somebody to take the clone and, and sell it under their own name. Because it would be giving clone a bad name and it, it would be bad for the people involved in the project. It's better when everybody's pushing the clone brand as a, an equal issue. Um, and don't pick crazy licenses, please. Like, don't, don't go for things that nobody else uses. Stick to, uh, I know this is controversial, but so Google Code has reduced the amount of licenses you can pick to, I think, seven. And uh, those are the seven most used licenses in the world. And they cover pretty much every spectrum of usage. And so picking one of those is a good idea. Because it's hard. I mean, once you get into this and you need to start combining things, it's, it's a nightmare to keep track of the different licenses. So, but decide that in the beginning. And if you redecide, make sure you have the ownership. Because if you have the ownership assigned to one entity, you can make that entity change the license. We could potentially change the license of phone to BSD now if we want to, because the foundation owns phone. If Linux can't change their license, because all the people that put code into uh, Linux have not said it's okay that you can change the license on my piece of code. So very important to have that at the beginning. Sorry, lots of ranting about the law. Measure everything. So when you do a project, Make sure you have stats on everything and, and keep his, histor historical data on everything. Because people people perform to the level you measure. So if you set a very high goal, people will stretch and they will try to hit that goal. They might not hit it, that doesn't really matter. But if you measure, you win. I mean, it's that simple. Like the reason Plum used to suck performance wise is that nobody measured it. Like there wasn't a nightly, oh my god, the thing something that was checked in yesterday made the code base twice as slow. Nobody knew. We just like did a release and it's like, oh, it's slower than the previous version. That kind of sucks. When did that happen? And then we need to dig back, you know? So do things with regular intervals, like run, run a test suite, time test suite, do some uh, you know, functional test, time them, and, and record them somewhere, like in a CSV file, so you can stuff it into OpenOffice or Excel or whatever and make nice graphs and say, hey, we've improved performance, you know? The other thing we do is uh, to use track. So track has this like progress bar report. It's like, oh, um, we, we have assigned these 50 issues to phone 3.1.4, and until those are fixed, we won't ship it. And it has a progress bar, and it says, oh, we're 50% of the way there. And people love progress bars. They're like, oh, I'm going to fix a bug, you know, because I'll push the progress bar up 2%. Um, so it's silly. It's just like basic psychology. Like, Make sure things are visible, make sure you can see progress, make sure there's data everywhere, and, and make nice representations of it. So you know, keep track of that stuff, because it makes things fun. So be opinionated. So one of the reasons, I don't know, there was a paper that hit Slashdot or Reddit or all these like, sites a while ago that says, you know, why, why open source has problems when it comes to user friendliness or usability. And you know, we went through all these like things that they could do to get better. But one of the core differences between an open source project and let's say something like Apple or more opinionated companies is that they have one strong leader that says, no, we won't do that. That makes no sense. And in the case of Plum, I'm that person. I say, you know, no, sorry, you know, go ahead and do that in your own project, but it makes no sense for the core. And be <coughs> opinionated, like have strong opinions on things. Uh, but you know back down when you know you're outnumbered. Like, I'm on the phone developer list and I say, hey guys, how about we do this? And everybody's like, are you on crack? You know, like, we can't do this, this is impossible. And when sufficiently many people have asked me whether I, I'm on drugs, I, I say, okay, maybe it was not a good idea. <laughs> um, so, you know, be willing to do that. But have strong opinions. And I don't think strong opinions is a, a problem in open source. You all have strong opinions, right? Uh, but like, focus them and, and make sure they're, they're focused on the right And be present, like be in your community. Ask for stuff on the mailing list. Um, I've been pretty bad at that lately uh, on the user list. I used to answer any kind of unanswered questions to all general list I would answer. Um, and it's hard to find time for that, but it, it pays back later. And make sure to find some time to inspire and lead the way. Like, you know, take, take a week off, go to Brazil, sorry. Um, <laughs> spending a week after, after this uh, 
in Brazil. But take some time to think and then come up with the next like year of goals, do these strategic summit things if you, if you can do that. Even just three people sit down and say, hey, next year, well, what do we want to be with the project? And what do we want to do? So make time for, for thinking. Don't be a hater. I don't know if you have Gatorade, but this is Haterade. Um, so, you know, be nice to other projects. Uh, there's a reason they do things differently. You know, if people do PHP projects, don't hate them. You know, they, they deserve sympathy. I mean, it's, it's hard for them to do PHP, but, um, but they, they have reasons to do whatever they're doing. And they have cool things. Like most projects have a couple of things that you can learn from them. Uh, and if the entire project sucks, they probably have a good community. You know? So, um, they have to, or else they wouldn't be around. So there is always something you can learn from other projects. And sooner or later, you will have to go to them and ask them about something. You know? Especially within the Python world. Uh, I, I just love it when, when people hammer on other Python projects. And, and they're like, well, you know, WishJ is coming. And probably in a year, you'll be using its code. You know? um, so be nice. I mean, it's, it's not a competition. This is not for the competition. It's other open source projects are your allies, no matter if you're not using the same language as and make it social. And I'm not talking Facebook, social. Um, <coughs> so do, do things like this, you know, do sprints, workshops, do meetings, meetups on the weekends or during the week, you know, have a phone local, local user group or a Python user group, I'm sure you have lots of them. Um, and make a conference as soon as you can, as soon as you think more than, you know, 20, 30 people will show up for your project, do a conference. Awesome. First phone conference was, I think, 50 people. So uh, the other thing you can do is, as a you know, stand-in for that, is stuff like IRC, like chat groups, stuff like that. They steal a lot of time, though, but it's a great way to start building a community when you're a smaller project. So people are always impressed that they can go and talk to the people that made them. So make all the hard decisions when you're face-to-face. -face. Don't discuss things on the mailing list. If you have a really like hard problem or a, a, like a major shift you want to do, don't do that on anyone because it will go on and on forever. So people in the same room, worst case, you know, fire up whatever kind of video chat you can have and, and try to get as many people online as possible and talk talk among people. Because doing stuff on mailing lists is really bad when it comes to the big decisions. On the small things, you know, figuring out things is possible. But do the do the major decisions face to face. Don't plan too far. Everybody says, oh, you know, plan, plan far ahead. Well, do that, but don't like assume that that will happen. Um, you can't predict the future. You work in open source. Whatever people want to work on, they will work on. So, you know, it might be incredibly important for phone to add, you know, ability to do dishes and laundry and stuff like that, but nobody wants to work on that, then it won't happen. So, you can, you can try to predict the future, and you can say, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we did this, to get people excited, but don't don't state your future on that, because things change all the time. So if you want to head in a particular direction, get people excited about that, but don't say, we're planning to go here, you know, that's it. Um, so get them excited about whatever you, <coughs> direction you want to go to. I love this sign, by the way, it's, it's so optimistic. It's like, this is a city in America somewhere. And uh, I don't know if, it, if, if it's like a, here, there will be a city here one day, or whether it's just like the city of the future, that's kind of grim, but that's how I build cities. And tell the world about your secrets. We're almost done. This is the next to last slide. Uh, when you do cool things, don't keep them to yourself. We kind of did this in the beginning in Plum, like we're like, oh, this is pretty cool, and only we have this technology, you know? like only we do this, which gives you a competitive advantage, but you have that anyway, because you invented it so you understand the problem space better than anybody else. So whenever you do something cool, write, write a blog post about it, like talk about it, shout it from the mountaintops. Because um, it makes the people respect you, it gets your product noticed, and it's all good. Like there are no downsides to telling the world your secret. And it's open source, they can see it anyway. You know, like, if they want to steal your thing, they can. So uh, you might as well take the credit for it. And the biggest thing this does is that it gets you new contributors. Like, if you look smart, all the smart people will like, would like to work with them. So, I don't know if you can even see this. It's like a, an abstract painting of some chairs flying out of a locomotive with a magician or something. I have no idea what, what's going on with the secrets. Um, so, this is the most important thing. The, the most, most important thing. The bright 
I would think people can change the world. I, I kind of joke sometimes that I could run home with five people. And it, it's true, but it's not the same five people. You know? That's why we have 200 of them, because we can switch out those five people. But at any one point, there are probably five people that are very important to me. And if you keep that focus, you can do anything. So think about that. Five people, build, you can build anything. And that's it. Thank you. So um, we kind of run two parallel tracks, and we have to do this right now because there's a lot of stuff that needs to change. Um, so three point whatever is to make sure you have bug fixes, security fixes, updates, and some small features. Like we make things easier, we package things in eggs, we, we do things that don't change how Plum operates for the end user because you don't want to upgrade Plum and suddenly people can't use Plum anymore. Um, and then that frees us up freeze up time and, and effort to go on a parallel track and say, hey, okay, what if we, is nothing we know now is true necessarily. We can re revisit those decisions and then we can make a better product here and then we let that thing meet later on. So it's not like a fork or anything. It's just like saying, you know, I don't care if this, if this breaks out on product X right now because we're in development mode on 4.0. So, and, you know, it's overdue. Like, Plum hasn't, fundamentally changed, it has and it hasn't. In some ways, we're still running code that is from you know, 2001 in certain locations, you know? But, but it's a big stack, so some, some of the zone code needs to be thrown out. Some, some things need to be done differently. We need to remove and make things up. So, I don't know. Who, who asked the question? Is there any specific thing? Oh. Uh, Does that answer your question? Yep. <laughs> É, próxima pergunta. É, eu gostaria de saber se o Plone implementa ou dá suporte à autenticação baseada em certificação digital. Uh, it's something like, uh, I would like to know if Plone implements or gives support to authentication based on digital certs. On what? Digital certs. Oh, uh, certificates. Okay. Yes. Um, so, the future in the whole authentication game is the whiskey stuff, right? We, we don't want to maintain our own authentication. So, Without knowing, so I know that people are doing cert-based certification with Plum, so I know it's possible. Um, but I think the easiest way to do that is usually to make Apache take care of that and then make Plum trust whatever Apache says. So Apache says, oh, this person is person X. And then Plum says, okay. You know, so you don't do the authentication inside Plum. Um, but in the future, it will probably be in, in components that are with G, which is the gateway and stuff. So you can share, like if you're running Trad and Plone and Turbo Gears and Pylons, they can all share the same authentication. Now a question for double. The people of Django have discussed if the releases will be based on dates or not. They talk about releases smaller, of 6 to 6 months. Some think it's a little bit of time. What advice would Plone have to 
dar o Django no que se refere a releases. Uh, Django people has discussed if uh, releases will be based on dates, or will be date based or not. Uh, they start. Uh, Django people has discussed yep. if uh, releases will be date based mm -hmm. or not. Yep. Uh, they speak on smaller re releases, something about six and six months. Yep. Uh, some people think this is too little time. Uh, what advice is Plon has uh, to offer to Django people uh, in this release? Okay, so Plon has done both feature-based releases and time-based releases. And so what we've ended up with is actually doing both, right? So that, that comes back to the 3.x and 4.0. 4.0 is a feature release. We don't know when that will be ready quite yet. We will know, we will soon know when we know that it's ready. It, it, we use some analysis and then we say, okay, with certain certainty, maybe in six months we can deliver 4.0. Uh, whereas we do strict time-based releases in 3.x. Right? So you get a new 3.x release every six to nine months, and you get a, a maintenance release every month. So my answer would be, be do both. <laughs> and uh, still on the same subject. O que o plano tem feito de bom e o que precisaria mudar em relação a eles? And about the uh, our uh, our plan releases, uh, what what were the good things and how what what can be improved? Sorry, uh, about the uh, the, uh, the our plan releases, not about the current one. No. Okay, let me rephrase. <laughs> uh, what plan has done uh, in this subject mm -hmm. release, and what need to change uh, about the release, release process? Yeah. Okay. So um, I think we're in pretty good shape. We're, people co complain a little bit because we're very strict about what gets into a maintenance release and what kind of improvements we will do. But we have to do that because right? it's very easy to introduce new bugs. Right? So what I think we can be better at is communicating exactly what we're planning to do in the future. And, but it, it's, it's a little bit hard because people don't get the we don't know when it's ready. You know, they, they think that's like, oh, you guys do not know what you're doing because you don't know when it'll be ready. And it's like, well, that's open source, that's how it works. So, um, so that's kind of what we would try to do by having some stable releases and, and more, more feature-based releases. Um, I don't know. Uh, we can definitely be much better at, at communicating what we're thinking about. Um, and, you know, it's one of the things that I want to work on is to make it easier to suggest new things like the probably in like uh, Ubuntu has like a idea storm or I can't remember what it's called, some sort of like idea gathering sites that you can vote up and down ideas. So we're definitely going to make it easier for people that are not, you know, coders to just go in and say, hey, wouldn't it be cool if Plone did this? And, you know, if we disagree, that's fine. But at least somebody suggested it and there's a record that somebody said, we'd like Plone to do X. And if people start voting up stuff that we're not doing, we're probably not turning out. Próxima. Uh, existe alguma iniciativa para fazer o clone rodar no clone 3? Caso não exista, como isso... Ah, isso, desculpa, no clone 3. Caso não exista, como isso poderia ser feito? Uh, is there any uh, work to make clone uh, run on Zoop 3? And uh, if it doesn't exist, uh, how that be done? Look, my fantastic it's very confusing, I know. It's it sucks and it's not our fault. I think. <laughs> okay, so what what really the, the main problem here is that they call Zo3 Zo3. They should never ever have done that. It's not Zo3, it's like something so and Zo3 isn't really an application server anymore, it's a collection of libraries. So I, I'm lobbying for them to like rename it into the, like the Zo libraries or something like that, because it's not really application server as such. It's just a collection of stuff you can use in any Python. So Plone is already running on Zoop 3 for the things that we can do. So what we've done here is essentially you won't notice, which is, is one of the, the key things that we wanted. We didn't want to rewrite everything from scratch because then you lose a lot of your customers. So and we have a lot of customers that pay good money for us to do this. So so we've Take, taking one-on-one component and said, hey, you know, 
know, uh, Zoe 3 has a better story for, let's say, authentication. Let's switch to that, you know, and then make, make that transparent so that when you upgrade to Kong 3, you got a new component for authentication. That was Zoe 3 based. Um, there are still things that live in Zoe 2, but there, this, this part becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and will possibly go away. But it's, it's not a goal in itself. Like, there is good code in Zoe 2 too. It's just like people don't don't see. They, they just have this like very broad brush and they say, oh, all well, Zoe 2 is bad. You know? uh, but there is good stuff in there too. But it could definitely be refactored. The other way they do it is the wish tree stuff, right? So uh, repose, which is another bad name. But, uh, it's a clever name, but it's a bad name. Repose has taken Zoe and made it into a wish tree application. Uh, and that's probably where Pong will be headed uh, in the coming releases. So, so what happens then is that we take, you know, Zope has fantastic granular security. How about we pull that out and make that available as a wish tree component instead of living inside Zope so everybody can use that uh, and have names <coughs> and permissions and apples and all that stuff. So essentially two, two directions, I guess. Uh, a lot of stuff will move over to Zope 3 and a lot of stuff will move out of Zope to become like pure Python components that uh, are in front of this. So. Sorry. Text message. It's a, uh, no, it's <laughs> a text message. 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 Okay, so one example is the templating language. Uh, I don't know if you've profiled ZBT as a template language. Um, it's not the fastest, it's not the slowest. It's like middle range performance. So uh, so we we went in, um, one of my friends worked at YouTube. So a while back he said, you know, all template languages suck. And everybody's done this. Like, it's like a rite of passage in Python. You write your own templating language, right? You have to do that. Uh, but this guy scaled YouTube. He knows the thing about scaling. YouTube is Python, and it serves up like 10% of the world's traffic. You know? He knows how to scale Python. So, and he said, you know, we're using Cheetah. And, and everybody's like, oh yeah, we use Cheetah, but it, because it's fast, but it's kind of ugly, and it's, it's kind of not nice to work with, but we use it because it's fast. So he was able to make uh, a template language that was an order of magnitude faster than Cheetah on, on you know, big table tests and stuff like that. Um, and, and those, so we were thinking about switching to that template language because it has a pluggable front end, so we could do the same syntax that we have now and use that. So what happened is that we looked into that and then we looked at what he had done because there are a couple of like simple tricks he does to make it extremely fast. And that's gone into a project called, uh, the, the module name is uh, Z3C, which is Zoe3 community, .pt for page numbers. It's a horrible name, it has to be rebranded. Um, but anyway, so they, they pulled out like a major lessons from the Spitfire project, which is the other one, which you can look up on Google Code, uh, which is the other template language. And uh, now we have most of those improvements in page templates, and a page template compatible thing. And um, Hanu actually sent out a mail um, just two days ago saying he has the full like internationalization support complete, metal support complete, tal complete, so we can switch it out now. So we can <coughs> switch template language, which saves a lot of time. Um, the other thing that we're doing is that we're, we just, if you go look at Pong Trunk now, it doesn't do what we call global. So, you know, back when Pong was young and green, we wanted to make it simple to write templates. So we did declare like a global namespace of stuff that you would be useful. And, you know, you use a lot of that, but you don't need to repoint that for every page. So we've gotten rid of that concept, and now you're explicitly saying, hey, I need those three variables. Don't look at anything else. And that makes Plum much faster. So if you look at Plum Trunk now, you can't use Plum Trunk you know, in production because it's missing some things, and some menus are not working and stuff like that. But it's, it's much faster. And uh, I've also posted some benchmarks to the menu list if you're interested. But, you know, our two priorities is make Plum faster and make it easier. That's what we're doing with Plum for. Nothing else. We don't even want to add features if we can avoid it. We just want to make it fast and easy. Next one. What about case you want to see? Can you see? What's the biggest Plum case you know? Um, <laughs> how do you measure biggest? <laughs> <laughs> Amount of users, traffic. I don't know. 
So, um, it's an online magazine called uh, Discover, which is one of the top three, I guess, like science magazines. And they show up and dig all the time. That's a fun site. Um, they have a really like sophisticated uh, back end, and then they do real you know, journalism. They write magazines and stuff like that. And they have a pretty simple, simple, simple-ish setup in front with varnish and, and lots of caching. They serve up a lot of users. The bigger challenge is to have when you have like 4,000 authenticated users and you can't cache anything. That's that's when they start becoming painful. Uh, so the project that John is doing is um, it's hard. It's so cultural, culturally, uh, it relies on cultural understanding. So you have a, a do you know Best Buy in America? It's like a big electronics chain. And then the European equivalent is called Dixons. It's like a, uh, a British you know, electronics chain. They, they had like a, an acquisition spree a couple of years ago. They bought all the small like electronics retailers in Europe. So they own everything. And so they're building an internet for that. And I don't know the numbers, but it's a pretty, pretty massive project. And you can't cheat. Like you can't just cash it. So you need to actually be fast. So, so they, they do a lot of work on this. So it's definitely a priority. And, you know, I don't want phones to be slow. It's, it's part of the user experience, which is what I'm concerned about. If you click a save button and it takes a minute to record the chance, that's not fun. So, yes, we are improving the phone. Próxima. Existe algo no clone como existe o kernel na Libris? Ou seja, algo para ajudar os iniciantes a programar o clone? Uh, is there anything on the porn world uh, as there is uh, current neighbors, as something like you have uh, new people type to work? Right. Um, so there is a mailing list that is um, about, I guess, installation and setup, which is like the initial, like, get people started and not um, It's a little bit of a problem because the general list is very unfocused. Um, there isn't a newbies list as such. Um, there is something called, my favorite list is something called product developers. It's like if you want to develop products for fun, you can go there. And it's very focused and it's very good. But it might be an idea, but most people seem to be fun you know? Like Most people on the user list are pretty, and, and where do you draw the line? It's like when are not a newbie anymore. So usually we recommend people to go to the RC channel and, and get some hands, hand holding in the beginning so they get the concepts. But yeah, definitely. Um, and, and you know the other part of that equation is to give more documentation and like instructional videos and you know make it super simple to get to a certain level of sophistication and fun by just watching videos or reading simple documents. So it's awesome. <coughs> if you have any good ideas <coughs> on those things, I'm happy to talk to you later. I think my my good for this. It's a bit too extreme, but okay. O uh, que você pensa sobre os recursos do clone para interoperabilidade entre sites como Alt, REST, OpenID e Data Portability? O que você pensa sobre o clone resource about interoperability uh, between sites like Alt, uh, Alt, REST, OpenID, Data Portability e Data Portability? So, uh, clone, clone 3 supports, clone 3 later ships with OpenID. Um, so obviously we're big fans of all of these things. Um, we're also starting to use more REST stuff. Um, personally, I don't know a lot about it. It's kind of a little bit outside of what I do, uh, but I know there are a lot of people in Plum that are excited about it, building these machines. Um, so we're also, I think we're, we joined the data portability initiative. All that. So, you know, we have people there. Uh, it's, sorry for the bad answer. I don't really know what's going on in that area. But, you know, we're open source, we like these things, we want to make them work. And to me, the biggest thing has been open ID because I want people to be able to go to phone.org and sign in without creating an account. And, you know, report bugs without creating an account is a massive thing. So, but open ID is a very geeky technology. Like, you know, when you do tests at Google, you get a totally different you know, viewpoint of what you can actually deploy. How normal people will never ever understand OpenID. So um, it, it's a hard problem, but we want to support OpenID, for example, because you don't have to choose only OpenID, which is great. You can say, oh, we can support OpenID too. Próximo. 
com o Python novo, o novo que deve ser 2.6 ou 3.0, ou algo assim, 3, 3, 3, é, muito do Python 2.4, 2.5 será incompatível. Em que isso pode interferir no Core 3? É, with the new Python, Python 3000, é, a lot of uh, the current Python versions uh, will be incompatible. Uh, how that could affect Plum 3? Um, so, of course, it affects Plum. I mean, Plum actually doesn't run on Python 2.5. It's, it's kind of crazy because uh, they broke something very deep inside uh, restricted Python when they did 2.5. So, um, to, to, to show, like, Google isn't using Python 2.5 and they're still in 2.4 because of that. Because 2.5 made a lot of changes and improved a lot of things, but also broke a lot of things that people were relying on. So, 2.5 was actually not a trivial upgrade. Um, as for Python 3000, um, right now, I mean, there isn't a compelling reason to switch from a, you know, it, it, it's not like an order of magnitude faster, it's not, it's a clean up of language, right? So it'll take a while before things switch. On the other hand, um, you know, there are tools to make those kind of things easier, but there, it's a big step, and it'll take a while before we can do that. But it's one of those things that, oh, we'd like to be in Python 3, you know, but what does it really give you? Un until everybody else is in Python 3, then it doesn't really matter that you're in Python 2. So, but, you know, people get excited about cleaning up the language, obviously, because Python has a few words that you want to get rid of. So, yes, we're doing it eventually. I don't know when. Last question. Do Plano 25 para o Plano 3, uma das poucas coisas que não mudaram tanto foi a forma de criar produtos tendo seu modelo UME. Mas isso parece que será também reestruturado. Você tem previsão para isso? Pode ser um pouquinho diferente, mas previsão mesmo. Pode ser Ok, let's translate this one. From Plano 2. 2.5 to Plum 3, uh, one of the things that uh, didn't change too much was the way to create new products using uh, UML models. Yep. But this thing, but look like, looks like this thing also is being restructured. Uh, do you have, what, what do you say about this? So, this thing is being what? Restructured? Um, um, restructured? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, Part of the um, approachability thing that we're talking about on the planning summit is, you know, it shouldn't be necessary for you to load this like crazy Java applet thing to be able to draw diagrams and then export that to make a content type, which is currently, you know, probably the simplest way to create a content type in the world. So there's a project called Dexterity, which is written by uh, Martin Espel, the guy who wrote that book. Um, and it's usable now in the sense that if you know what you're doing, you can use it. Uh, but its goal is essentially to, the killer app for Zoe when it came out was that you could do things through the web. You could click and you can get some stuff. You know, you can get your own type with like a form and then you save it and it's persistent and all that stuff. And we want to bring that back to phone uh, without all the bad things that Z classes in Zoe did. So what this does is that you can construct your content type through the web. Um, by selecting what kind of fields you want and what kind of restrictions you want on them. And then you can push a button and you get it on the file system as a product and then you can distribute that and version that. So it's pretty pretty amazing technology. It's like nobody else has anything similar. And it, especially if you go look outside the you know, Python world or in other CMSs, they're not even close to having anything like this. Um, and that's, that's definitely one of the things that we, we want to land in Phone 4 is the new way. And so what's cool about that is that you can kind of jump over. So we, we, we don't need to care about Zoe 2 anymore, right? So uh, by, by coming up with this uh, way of creating content types, and please don't misunderstand me. Archetypes will continue to work. Whatever you do now will continue to work. But we can redo this from the ground up and make it fast and make it efficient. And that's essentially what's happening. That, that jump from Zoe 2 to Zoe 3 for content types is a bit special in the sense that it's harder to make it backwards compatible. So we may have to maintain both of those until nobody wants to use the other solution anymore. But already I prefer the new solution. So, I mean, it's one of those things that you aren't forced to upgrade an open source, right? It's not like people, you can't
can't get the code anymore, or you know, you can't buy the product anymore. So you have a massive deploy site on on 2.0, and the customer doesn't want to upgrade. Well, it pays you to maintain, sorry, and it pays you to maintain that. So so we can be a bit more aggressive on those things, uh, and it's it's something that is needed. It, it's also more pure Python, so dexterity can be used outside of the phone. It has phone specific bits, but they're in a separate you know package. So you know other systems may make use of that kind of type system through the web. So it's it's worth it, even though it sounds scary. You know, it's it's like oh we're throwing out archetypes, which kind of and kind of not. You know, we, we keep it working, uh, but we have to do this because so much of phone's performance problems is tied up into bad decisions made in Arduino's years ago, you know? and bad decisions made in phone. So it's unfortunate, but we have to break things every now and then, and that's what deprecation warnings are for. We keep deprecation warnings for two releases. If you're still writing code that triggers deprecation warnings, well, sorry, we can't help you. Like, you have to update it. Last time, question? Uh, does Google use this problem? <laughs> yes, um, but internally. And, um, we, so I can't talk about. You know, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, so we're not using it in any kind of you know, public fashion. It's not like there will be a uh, phone, like a version of phone that is a Google product. We're using it internally to keep track of. Like uh, uh, we have one one instance where uh, we we gather ideas. It's more like a, a user interface centric idea tracker. So. I sit down and I um, jot down an, an idea on a piece of paper with a little drawing of how it should work. And I hold it up to my laptop and I take a picture of that drawing. And then that goes into um, the plum site, which has, it's just like an issue tracker, right? <coughs> which is kind of ironic since I say you should write issue trackers in plums. But, but it's, it's, a, it's a content focused issue tracker, right? So it's more like, you know, it has states and stuff like that, but it's not really an issue tracker. It's more like we have this idea. And it's in this area. So let, let's say, oh, I have a brilliant idea on how you know Google search for mobile should work. And then you make that thing, you put it into the system, add some description, and it's in there. And you know who made it, when they made it, and then you can group them, right? So once every six months, you go in and you print out all the, the things, all the ideas that you had. You have a meeting and you look at all the ideas about what people want to do, and you figure out which one of them you want to pursue. So you know, it's not something you couldn't have done in any other project. But you know, it, it was easy to do in a box. It was, it was UML, you know, draw some boxes, click a button, it was done, it worked. So I did it. That's how easy it was. I'm not a programmer, so yes. So they, they do use Plum, but not in a, not in a like it, it'll never be a product, and, and nothing becomes a product for Google because the amount of things you need to do to scale is insane. Right? That's why you can't you can't write the next YouTube. Like as a reusable product, there's no, no, no way to do that. So, same. Thank you, Lily. Thank you. 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 Thank you.